<clears throat> Hi there, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Ben Kellerhalls. I'm an intern here at the National History Academy, and we want to thank you for joining us as we continue to look through America's great historical landscapes. Today, we're virtually visiting with Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park for a virtual talk Q&A. Um, and joining us for that is Yolanta Ryan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. Is it okay to share my screen though? Yeah, feel free. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. So my name is Yolanta Ryan. I'm the education specialist here at the Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park in Skagway, Alaska. And first I want to say thank you for choosing to learn about our park and the unique history that surrounds the Klondike Gold Rush. Now the Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park, also known as KLGO, was established in 1976 to commemorate the more than 100,000 people who tried to make their way to the gold fields in just over a two year span. The gold rush only lasted from 1897 to 1899. But the gold rush was a significant historical event. So in 1976, Congress passed a bill to preserve four sites to remember the gold rush. Now here at the park, we have three of those sites. And then the fourth site is actually located in Seattle, Washington, our sister park, where many of the stampeders began their journey. So in this slide here, you can see the town site of Dai, which is kind of a mud flat area where many of the stampeders landed. And then they would take the Chilkoot Trail into Canada and into the gold fields, which are about 550 miles into Canada. They also landed in the town of Skagway here, which is more of a deep water port. So the big ships could come in and then they would take the White Pass Trail. And here's a picture of uh, downtown Skagway as it currently looks like and our visitor center, if you ever come this way. Now it's difficult to talk about the gold rush without talking about how gold was discovered in the Klondike. And to be clear, gold was never found here in Skagway. Instead, it was found along a tributary of the Klondike River called Rabbit Creek in the Yukon Territory of Canada. So on August 16th, 1896, an American prospector named George Carmack, his taggish wife, Sha Claw, also known as Kate Carmack, her brother Keish, also known as Skookum Jim, and their nephew Ka Gooks, also known as Dawson Charlie, were traveling south on the Klondike River. Following a suggestion from a Canadian prospector, Robert Henderson, they began looking for gold on the tributary. Now it was not clear who discovered the gold, if it was George Carmack or, <coughs> excuse me, Keish, um, but the group agreed that it was George Carmack because it would appear, uh, George Carmack, um, because they were feared that the authorities were not sure how they would feel about a claim made by an indigenous person. So, and due to the remote location of the Yukon, news of the gold discovery slow, slowly made its way to the lower 48. And it didn't become international news till almost a year later when two famous ships landed on the docks of Portland, Oregon and San Francisco, California in 1897. The Excelsior, Excelsior docked in San Francisco, followed by a days by Portland and Seattle. In a matter of hours, newspapers were printed with headlines reading gold, gold, gold. Newspapers estimated that miners brought in around $1.5 million worth of gold. That is nearly $33 million today. Now this would have been exciting news at any time, but it was especially exciting in 1897. When westward expansion had just ended, the country was still suffering a severe economic depression following the panic of 1893. It was reported that half of the country was living at or below the poverty line. People were hungry, people were desperate. So when one of the miners got off the gold ship and told a reporter, the Klondike is no, no doubt the best place to make money that there is in the world. It started one of the greatest stampedes in American history. There's a video here. There we go. Now, people across the US traveled to the Western ports of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle to buy passage on the ships sailing north. People quit their jobs and even left their cars in the middle of the street to make their dash to the banks to withdraw funds 
needed to venture to the Klondike. Even the mayor of Seattle left his job in hopes of finding riches in the last frontier. The majority of people looking to journey to the Klondike went to Seattle. And it's not because Seattle was that much of a better port, but because Seattle waged a very successful advertising campaign. Seattle branded itself the gateway to the Klondike, the only place you can buy authentic Klondike supplies. So within weeks, thousands of stampeders loaded themselves on pack steamers and made their way to the Klondike. Now the journey from Northwest coast of the United States to Skagway could take anywhere from three days to three weeks, depending on the vessel and the weather in Southeast Alaska. It could still take about a week just getting here from Juneau. <laughs> Men, women, and their families endured seasickness and cramped quarters aboard the, aboard the vessel. As the boats drew closer to the docks of Skagway and Dai, the thought of landing on solid ground became a delight. Stampeders believed their journey would even get easier as they made their way into town, but they didn't realize how lawless Skagway would be. They had to navigate the town without getting swindled, robbed, or murdered. Shootings were commonplace, and you could hear their noise among the music and the talking within the parlors and the brothels of the red light district. The town of Skagway went from a population of five to 5,000 in just a few weeks, hitting its population peak at about 10,000 in 1898. The tents and muddy trails were soon transformed into wooden storefronts and proper buildings. Muddy streets were lined with boardwalks. The Moors, who homesteaded here in Skagway prior to the rush, had lost control of their land as Stampeders claimed the property for themselves. Now, no one could have prepared for the number of people that would come to Skagway. Land and resources were quickly taken from anyone who settled on the land prior to the rush, and it quickly filled with individuals who were seeking to travel one of the trails, or those who had to turn back, and those who had no resources left to make their journey home. The crime and lawlessness was difficult to control. Without a standing police force, control of Skagway fell into the hands of Jefferson Randolph Smith, also known as Soapy Smith. Before anyone realized, he had sized the power of Skagway through his small militia of men who were willing to do his dirty work. Journalists, merchants, and businessmen were all in his pocket, and his influence reached all the way up to the border and onto the trails. And those who were not swindled as they traveled through town were robbed and cheated by Soapy's men on the trail. And my colleague Teresa was just going to add a little tidbit about uh, Soapy and his gang. Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa. I'm an intern with Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park. Um, and I want to take a minute to tell you about the story of Soapy Smith and really why he was so notorious um, for being a gangster in Skagway. Now, Soapy Smith was actually born in the South in Georgia. And this was during the period of time when, you know, the West was kind of lawless and wild, and he wanted to join in on this. So he actually made his journey to Texas and Colorado, and he was trying to be kind of the traditional, let's say, cowboy, making an honest living. But he soon realized he can make a really good living taking money from people who weren't quite as wise in the con arts as he was. Um, so he actually set up a really elaborate con scheme in Colorado. Um, but once the Klondike opened up and he realized that there was gold for the taking from miners who might be traveling up north, he decided to go to the Klondike and he made the statement that he was going to rule Skagway and he was going to be the ruler of this town. So he made his way to Skagway. And as Yolanta mentioned, he got a lot of people in his pocket. So business owners, uh, miners who maybe were down on their luck or kind of realized there might be more money in working cons than maybe traveling up one of these passes became part of Soapy's network. And so some of the famous cons that he was known for um, was one, how he got his nickname. Um, so Randolph Smith ended up um, creating a soap con for people in Skagway. So he would actually um, sell bars of soap for $5. And he would have this crowd of people he was trying to sell to, but he would actually plant some of his men in this crowd. And he would 
tell them that if you buy this $5 bar of soap, that there's a chance you're going to find a $100 bill inside of there. And he would sell a bar of soap off and it would be to one of his men that were in the crowd and they would open that bar of soap and sure enough, they would find that $100 bill. And so people started buying these and he made quite a profit off of this con because the only people who would ever win those $100 would be his men. Another crafty one he had was a fake telegraph service. Um, he actually had a telegraph line that just ran into the woods. It didn't go anywhere, but he told people that he would send out these telegraphs back home. And so people would spend quite a bit of money trying to send messages back to their families and his people, his men who were kind of in cahoots with him, if you will, would actually write letters back that were fake and make people think they were getting these telegraphs. And he even had copies of, you know, the Masons signatures and um, some of the other larger groups in the US to kind of fake this paperwork and this documentation. So he was quite smart. Um, he also had a puppy adoption um, ring because he was a con man. People were getting angry that they were taking his money. They were starting to get in, you know, that he wasn't the person he was advertising himself to be. So he tried to help women, widows, you know, of men who maybe died on the trails. There were a lot of stray dogs from all the miners who were coming in who maybe were down on their luck and let their dogs loose. So he had a puppy adoption um, event and he actually adopted puppies himself. He wanted to kind of give this really good facade for himself. You want to hit the next slide, Yolanta? Yep. So things kind of turned on Soapy because as I mentioned, people became wise to his cons. And this is an image of this vigilante group um, that they called themselves the Skagway 101. Um, and they were trying to take down Soapy Smith. And the night that he died, um, what ended up happening is he was running an illegal card game in his parlor and he took two thousand six hundred dollars um, from a miner and the miner got very upset by this and he demanded that soapy return his money to him now the vigilante group had gathered on the docks because soapy refused to return the money he said he won the money fairly and that he shouldn't have to owe the miner anything um, from his winnings so of course, the vigilante group is out on the docks talking about ways that they could get Soapy and round him up. And Soapy decided to confront them. And a man named Frank Reed got into an altercation with Soapy on the docks and ended up shooting Soapy um, and killing Soapy immediately. And Frank Reed actually got shot himself and died 12 days later. Uh, but that was the end of Soapy Smith. And after he died, his men kind of dispersed um, from the town. They went their separate ways. But that's kind of the story of this notorious man. And we have the um, Just Miss Parlor in town, um, which is the original parlor that he used um, to work his cons, which is now or was once a 10 cent um, dime museum. So it's kind of a cool building if you ever come to visit. Thank you, Teresa. Yep, so that was the famous Soapy Smith. And now we're going to talk a little bit more after the Stampeders uh, came to Skagway and Dai. Um, they had to take a trail north. So let's take a moment to look at the map here of the routes the Stampeders could have taken to the gold fields. And your question might be if there's so many routes, why did so many individuals decide to come to Skagway and Dai, which are located over 500 miles from the gold fields. And the reason is because of the Yukon River here. So the Stampeders only had to hike about 50 miles to get to the headwaters of the Yukon River. And then they would build their boats and sail down the Yukon River to Dawson City. So the Yukon River was their main draw here. Now, Stampeders who landed in Skagway or Dai had to decide between taking one of the two of the trails le leading to Lake Bennett, which was the headwaters in the Yukon. And as the stories of the journeys the Stampeders faced trickled down through journalism, the trails developed notorious reputations. People, re people realized that regardless of the trail they chose, there really was no good choice. As Martha McKeon wrote, one's hell and the other's damnation. 
So to add to these struggles, the Canadian government required every stampeder to bring a year's supply of goods before they were allowed into Canada. Few of the people headed to the Klondike had any idea what was in store for them. And the Canadian Mounted Police noticed the malnourished state of the stampeders. To, so to prevent the starvation, the one ton law, also known as a ton of goods, was enacted. The supplies required by the government included three pounds of food per day for one full calendar year. This requirement alone would weigh over half a ton. But now if you plan to mine the gold and add the necessary clothes and equipment, you could easily double that weight. So the stampeders not only had to figure out how to get themselves over the trails, but now they had to consider how to get another 2,000 pounds of goods to make it into Canada. Teresa will go in a little bit um, to different ways that they did that. So stampeders had to decide if they were going to take the Chilkoot Trail or the White Pass Trail. Now, depending on which trail they would decide to go on, determined how they were going to carry this one ton of goods over the Canadian border. And so they had a few different options. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have some you know, pack animals. So oxen, mules, horses were very common, um, especially for people taking the White Pass Trail because it was advertised as a trail that you could use pack animals on. Um, some people decided to use sled dog teams and maybe some odd choices like you know, a team of goats or sometimes a team of elk. Um, Stampeders got very creative in what animals they were utilizing to help them carry these items over the trails. Um, there's even records of somebody using a bear to pull a sled or moose. Um, so it's kind of interesting what lengths they went to um, to help them get these supplies. Another option would be to hire a Clinket packer. And this was common for people who were hiking the Chilku Trail because it was not conducive to pulling wagons. And the reason why Clinket Packers would have been an option for this trail is because the Chilkoot Trail actually was a Clinket training route prior to the gold rush. And so the Clinket, the native people who were living in the Skagway, Dai area prior to Stampeders, used this route as a way to do trade with other tribes within the Yukon. So they knew it well, they knew the landscape, the dangers that might come with it. And they were also used to carrying heavy weights over this rough terrain. And the stampeders that were coming to the Yukon, most of them were working in offices or staying at home. They weren't used to such rugged terrain carrying large loads on their backs. And the Clinket lost control of this trading route because the Chilkoot Trail became so popular. So one thing they resorted to was actually hiring out their services to the Stampeders um, for money to take their help them take their supplies to the Klondike. So that was another option for those wanting to make this journey. Go ahead, Yolanta. Right. So as I mentioned, there were two trail options, as Teresa did as well. And this is the Chilkut Trail. We'll start with that one. So for many people, the Klondike Gold Rush is characterized by a single scene called the Golden Staircase. Now it shows a solid line of men forming a human chain going up the white face of a mountain. Each man is nearly bent over double with the weight of his pack. The iconic picture characterizes all the terror and the hardships hopeful miners were prepared to overcome to quench their thirst for gold. So now the Chilkut Pass has come to be a symbol of the stampede. On this trail, which is 33 miles long, the last one eighth of a mile from the summit climbs a thousand feet and heading over the pass, which as you can imagine is quite steep. So the Stampeders <clears throat> carved 1500 steps into the snow and ice and then charged a toll to use it. It took about six hours to climb and load it down with packs. Most men could only make the climb once a day. The avalanches were a common threat along the trail. Some would be catastrophic. One would kill about 65 people. And around 30,000 to 35,000 people took the Chilkoot Trail during the gold rush. Now the White Pass Trail was quite different as you can see from the Chilkoot Trail. This was a 40 mile trail, which was less steep than the Chilkoot Trail and was advertised by William Moore as a trail for pack animals. Horse, oxen, mules, dogs, and even mountain goats were used to haul supplies up the summit of the White Pass. 
lack of funds and a desire to make it to the top of the pass as quickly as possible led to horrible conditions for the animals. Although the trail was advertised as a pack animal trail, it couldn't have been more misleading. There were muddy conditions, narrow cliffs, and boulders. There were just some of the hazards that the animals had to traverse. They were overloaded with equipment and supplies were often unbalanced and the animals were often starved and abused. So by September in 1897, conditions on the treacherous White Pass Trail had deteriorated to such a degree that it was virtually impassable. Of the estimated 5,000 stampeders who started over this trail in 1897, only about 10% made it through successfully. One Gold Rush participant claimed that men are quitting the struggle every day. And as we go along, we see strong men coming back with tears running down their cheeks, completely broken down and the stream of humanity passes on, paying no heed to their sufferings. On the trail, Stampeders face disease, malnutrition, and death due to murder, suicide, avalanches, and hypothermia. To make matters worse, the trail had become littered with corpses of several thousand horses that had died, hauling the supplies through the knee-deep rock and mud. The trail soon earned the grim name, Dead Horse Trail. Jack London traveled to the gold fields via the White Pass Trail, and he said it best. That the horses died like mosquitoes in the first frost and from Skagway to Bennett, they rotted in heaps. They died at the rocks, they were poisoned at the summit, and they starved at the lakes. Men shot them, worked them to death, and when they were gone, they went to the beach and bought more. Their hearts turned to stone, those that did not break, and they became beasts, the men of the Dead Horse Trail. Now this is a little bit more uplifting, Teresa will talk about Harriet Poland. <laughs> So the White Pass Trail um, was not all doom and gloom. Harriet Pullen actually became famous for her ability to navigate the White Pass Trail. Um, she came to Skagway with $7 in her pocket, but she was very good with horses. And she soon found out that she could easily navigate, you know, a four horse um, carriage through the White Pass Trail. And so she actually ordered for her horses to be shipped up to Skagway from the lower 48. And she used her own horses to um, help people and their supplies get through the White Pass Trail. And that was her day job, if you will. And then at night, she would actually hammer out um, tin pans out of old cans to make apple pies for the miners. And of course, they were going to pay money to get you know, a fresh baked apple pie, especially out on the trails or in cold Skagway. And she made quite a bit of money for herself. And she actually lived the rest of her life in Skagway and created the Pullen House, um, which was a beautiful hotel that was in Skagway. And she was able to really provide well for her family and her children um, through her entrepreneurial endeavors during the gold rush. And Harriet wasn't the only woman who was able to be successful and made a name for herself during this time period. A lot of women came to the Klondike with their husbands and with their families and using their, you know, business savvy, their smarts, some of them were very successful. Um, for example, you had people like Ethel Berry who came on the Excelsior in 1897 with her family because they were out there mining gold. And she was one of those people who got a fortune out of finding the gold um, in the Klondike. And they actually invested in oil um, in later years. And they were, they were a very wealthy, well-to-do family now. You also had people like um, Klondike Kate and Belinda Mulrooney who were mining the miners, which is a term that we use when you kind of help the miners through. And so a lot of women helped with laundry businesses, hotels. So Belinda Mulrooney was considered the richest woman in the Klondike. And she actually opened um, the Fairview Hotel in Dawson, which was the premier um, hotel in the area. It was a three-story building. It had all of the luxury um, that you would expect with the hot baths and, you know, great beds. And so she made a large profit off of her mining the miners by opening a hotel. Another great character is Klondike Kate. Um, she's one of my favorites. So she dressed as a man to make her way over the trails and into Dawson. And when she got to Dawson, she realized there's a lot of miners in the city who have a lot of gold. 
And her way of emptying their pockets was to become a successful dancer. And so she would entertain the men who were in Dawson and she would just have, you know, outfits with gold nuggets draping off of them and gold in her teeth. And she was just the most well-known entertainer in um, the Yukon. And she ended up actually later in life becoming one of the first female Mounties um, in the Yukon. So she spent the rest of her life up there. Um, but she is actually one of the key characters um, in Klondike history and one of my favorite ones. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Now we're gonna talk about the journey as they went over the passes. So individuals that were lucky enough to make it to the summit of either of the Chilkoot Trail or the White Pass Trail were now faced with their next major challenge, making it 500 miles down the Yukon River. Lake Lindemann and Lake Bennett were the two locations that Sam Peters decided to stop to build their boats for the next length of their journey. A forest along the lakes were cleared, a 7,000 boats were constructed, and 30,000 people along the 60 miles were waiting in tents for the spring thaw that would take them down the river. The greatest tent city had been built on the shores of the lakes as people waited several months for the winter to give way to spring. After months of inactivity, oops, sorry, this was a video. Here we go. After months of inactivity, everyone was now in a race to be the first to the Klondike to strike it rich. Like the trails, the Yukon River has its share of challenges. The first challenge came in the form of Miles Canyon Rapids. These rapids were formed as the wide Yukon River was funneled through a very narrow canyon. These rapids had claimed enough lives that the Canadian Mounted Police were stationed at the head of the rapids, stopping any stampeders from navigating their boats themselves. The stampeders could either hire an experienced riverman to navigate the rapids, or they could portage their supplies and boat around the rapids if they couldn't afford the fee. Once the stampeders navigated the rapids, they sailed closer to Dawson City, where the gold fields were located. And here's the city of Dawson City once they arrived. Dawson City became known as the Paris of the North. It was the largest city north of Seattle. The rumor was that gold was in abundance here. However, for many of the stampeders, once they arrived, they began hearing disturbing rumors that proved to be a devastating truth. They discovered that most of the gold had already been claimed, and most of these claims were staked before the news of the gold had even reached the lower 48 in 1897. People began making fortunes by mining the miners, as Teresa said. The best food, drink, and clothing were all available for purchase at high cost. The first egg in Dawson sold for $5, and tomatoes sold for $5 a pound. By July 1898, Dawson had two banks, two newspapers, five churches, and a telephone service. About 30,000 people from the trails and ships had arrived in Dawson, with people constantly moving in and out of the city. The city flourished until gold was discovered in Nome. Alaska in 1899. Teresa, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So the White Pass and Yukon Railroad um, was one of the big turning points for um, Skagway and Dye and for people who were looking to find a really good route to the Klondike. So the White Pass and Yukon Railroad was built right down Broadway in Skagway. So it was right down the middle of the street and it went through the White Pass. So we had a train being built on these narrow ridges and these narrow cliffs that not even mules and carts could pass. So the construction of the White Pass Railroad had a lot of obstacles that, that the uh, engineers had to face. Um, the timber in the area wasn't good enough to use, so they actually had to import um, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of timber. They had to import hundreds and hundreds of pounds of dynamite. So this was a very expensive project and a very long project. Um, it took well over a year for the White Pass Railroad to be constructed. Um, engineers had to deal with 30 foot snow drifts, um, as you can see in some of these pictures in the winter, um, and trying to find ways to navigate these narrow cliffs. So they had to create tunnels um, and they had to create these bridges across um, cliffs and gorges um, that lie on the trail as well. And so 
1899 in February, so we're talking the middle of the Alaskan winter, that was the first time that the Yukon Railroad uh, made its way to the summit of the White Pass. And in July of that year was when they fully finished the railroad so it could reach Lake Bennett, um, so people could then make their way into Dawson. And the construction of the railroad meant, you know, a solid income for Skagway. So people who were trying to make their way to the Klondike would now come to Skagway only because they can now take the railroad instead of hiking the Chilkoot to get to the Klondike or to get to Dawson. Dai, on the other hand, died out. So a lot of the businesses left, a lot of the buildings were deconstructed. The Chilkoot Trail got a reputation for being incredibly dangerous because of the avalanches that did occur. So the use of that also died out as well. The Yukon Railroad was used after the gold rush um, to help people get to Dawson. Dawson does still exist, um, and it's the second largest city in the Yukon currently, um, but also was a really um, important factor in supplies. Um, so during World War II, um, providing supplies for the construction of the Alaska Highway, um, and then also delivering ore to and from the Klondike after that. Um, it became kind of a tourism train in the 1980s. Eighties, I believe it was 1988, um, is when it started to take off as um, kind of a key tourism point for the town of Skagway and for people who might want to hike the Chilkoot someday. Um, so if you ever decide to come to Skagway, you can actually hike the Chilkoot Trail to Lake Bennett and catch the White Pass and Yukon Railroad from Lake Bennett back to Skagway, which is a very popular option um, when the borders open. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, and th that actually concludes our presentation, but I did want to end with a plaque that rests near the top of the Chilkoot Trail that commemorates the Klondike Stampeders. And it reads, in 1897, Klondike Stampeders by the thousands funneled over this ancient Indian trail, enduring incredible deprivations and hardships, their tenuous spirit dominating all obstacles, continues to inspire pioneers venturing north to the future. Thank you for listening. And yes, we'll take any questions. <laughs> awesome, what a great presentation. Thank you both. And um, to go through some questions that we have um, that are still coming in, I think uh, right now I'll introduce uh, Anjali Rose, a fellow intern here at National History Academy. Um, and Anjali, perhaps you can get us started with a question. Yeah, of course. Um, so the first question we have for you guys, um, many people have been under the impression that the gold rush was primarily in California. Um, what is the difference between the California gold rush and the gold rushes that happened in Klondike and the greater Alaska area? Yeah. Teresa, do you know, that was a different gold rush in California. I don't remember what year. Do you know much history about that one, Teresa? <laughs> Uh, it was about 1849, um, around that time period. So it was just earlier uh, than the Klondike Gold Rush. And really the primary difference was, um, you know, westward expansion had just ended. So you're right, the California Gold Rush did happen. It was kind of the same bit of frenzy um, for people to make their way across the country. Um, it was still a time of adventure at that time period. Um, but really, we had expanded as far west as we could here in the lower 48. So when news of the gold being found in the Klondike arose, um, it was kind of this nude excitement of new land. There was new areas to explore. So yes, part of it was about money. Um, it was during a time of a depression when people didn't really have much. Um, there was a crash of, what was it, 1893, correct, Yolanta? Right. So people were desperate to, to find a way to support their families. And so a lot of people did come hoping to find riches, but a lot of others came because they were, you know, sons or grandsons or granddaughters of people who were frontiersmen. And they just kind of wanted to get out there and explore and to record it. So people like Jack London, who just wanted to see an adventure and have one of their own too. 
Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, another question we have. Oh yeah, um, how do you collaborate with local indigenous communities and how do you manage telling those stories at the site? Yes, that is a tricky thing, but we do have a um, Taya uh, council here that has a native community and we always, um, honor them highly. We talk to them first about what they would like to share. We bring them into the park and ask permission of what is uh, they'd like to share with the public and um, what they wouldn't. So they're very much incorporated in what we share. And it, it, it was kind of a smaller native community here to begin with during the gold rush. There was more of a trading. Um, people would come from the north and trade their furs with the people, um, the, the, the Clinket Native um, Americans, um, they would have like the fish and the hooligan and the oil that they would trade with the furs. So it's just more, more of a trading post rather than a community that was centered here because it's a pretty harsh place to settle. A lot of people settled a little bit like 15 miles south of us is the um, Chilkat Valley where it's more open and there's moose and some deer and more animals too hunt and fish. Um, but there are a few uh, native locals here um, still remaining that we do counsel with on a regular basis. If you want to add anything, Teresa, too. Well, yeah, thanks for that explanation that it's always we see that parallel at a lot of different sites. Yeah, Anjali? Yeah, so our next question, um, how legitimate was the chance for someone to make it rich? Um, what were the odds of someone actually finding gold and coming away with fortune? It was very slim. I think only a handful of people, like maybe 20, you know, <laughs> struck it rich, but People mined, like Teresa was saying, mine the miners. So people still were able to make some money in different ways. But the really people that found the gold and made it rich are very slim compared to the numbers that came. As, as I recall, that might be the largest parallel between this gold rush and the earlier one in California is that the greater industry was mining the miners. <laughs> Teresa, were you going to add something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, when you kind of consider the amount of time that would have taken stampeders during that time period to get up here in Alaska, and you already had people who were in the area who were already starting to mine and starting to explore, that everything was really claimed very early on. And so there was only maybe a couple of hundred people out of the thousands that came that actually had gold in their pocket from actually mining it. Most of the gold that people found in the Klondike was through business entrepreneurship um, and getting gold, sometimes thievery as well. Um, but yeah, working the actual um, river and getting the gold itself, it was already pretty much claimed by the time most stampeders got here. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, let's see. Um, oh, here's, here's a good one. Um, it, we know that it's often considered that the purchase of Alaska by uh, Seward was called Seward's Folly and that this was sort of seen as a great mistake on the US's part. Did this gold rush have a part to play in that perception changing? I'm not sure, Teresa, would you have any replies? To, um... No, that's a really good question, but I can't say that I know the direct answer to that. Um, probably to some extent, right? You found gold um, in the area, so some people got rich off of it, but a direct answer to that, I'm not sure. It's a really good question, though. Yeah, it's, we'll have to look that one up. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Anyway, I think still some questions coming in. Anjali? Yeah, a um, new question just came in um, from Melissa Yi on Facebook. What type of mining was done?
Um, the what I know of is a lot of the pan mining. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, Teresa, do you did you? I think that was mostly how it started. You know, now they've developed. They're still mining up in the Yukon um, with dredges and a lot more excavating and um, water sluicing. And but I think it started off with just a gold pan, as, as I'm aware of. Great. Well, let's see. We have um, a few. Let's see. We have a few more questions. Let's go. This one I can sort of coalesce together. Um, how has the environmental history changed since the time of the gold rush, or how has the mining impacted the environment over there? I mean, we've heard some tragic tales of some animals experienced there, but what is that like, and how is that um, told at the park? You know, I, we don't talk too much about that. I think it's so far from where we are located, where the gold mining actually happened, that we just don't interact a lot with that. And I think at that point, you know, it was kind of on a much minor scale with the gold panning. I think now there's definitely bigger environmental consequences and things we see. Um, but we haven't touched on that area from the Klondike Gold Rush. Do, do you know much, Teresa? Have you heard much? We both started recently <laughs> this year, so we're still learning. So really the main environmental impact um, was a what all of the traveling did to the trails. Um, it just pretty much destroyed the trails, um, kind of similar to what a lot of parks are experiencing now when you have this um, kind of overwhelming population increase over these small trails. It, it does a lot of ecological damage to plants and trees, um, but also thinking about the amount of lumber that these men had to use. Um, so building their ships on Lake Bennett, the area was almost entirely um, deforested to build the ships to sail down the Yukon. Same with Skagway. Um, if you come to Skagway now, you'll see a lot of trees in the areas of um, Lower Dewey Lake, in the area surrounding the town, but at one point they were completely cleared and cleared to the point that the rock cliffs were actually used um, as advertisements. So you'll still see some graffiti up there um, from the Stampeders advertising their businesses because you didn't have the trees in the way. Um, so that was something that we have a lot of before and after photos showing the new growth, the new forests that are emerging on places like Lake Bennett um, and Skagway and, and what it did look like at the um, gold rush. And, and it was in terms of the forest, there was a lot of damage done. That's a very good point. Thank you, Teresa. Well, thank you both for your time and your presentation today. You're wonderful. Um, I know that I learned so much um, from the both of you. Um, our final question that we just always love to ask our great guide is how you got started at the site and any sort of advice that you'd be willing to give to students who are looking to enter the field. Um, so for the both of you. Yes, um, and I started in May and my background is science and education. I ran education programs at a library in a town nearby of, uh, in Haines for over five years. Um, and then I came to Skagway and I worked at the school, um, just working in the classes. And this position opened up and I think just my science background and my background in uh, teaching children and I uh, was able to receive the education specialist job. So that's me and Teresa. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually um, am just finishing up a six month internship um, with um, KLGO. And so for me, um, I actually got my bachelor's in um, historical sociology. And I actually worked in higher education. So I'm a little bit, I'm a career changer, um, which is becoming more common. Um, so if you don't have it figured out right away, it's totally okay. 
Um, but I decided to go back and get my master's in environmental science. And so I'm currently finishing up that. And as of Monday, I will be starting my first official position with the National Park Service. Um, so it's definitely doable, um, but the internships were a great way to learn about the NPS, um, just government jobs in general too, and what to expect and really get that hands-on experience. So I would highly recommend it if anybody was to consider um, a career move to you know, doing something like we do now. Awesome. Well, oh, oh you're, oh, go I'm ahead. <laughs> oh, I didn't know if Teresa, you mentioned you, she was an intern for the SCA, the Student Conservation Association. So that was a great way to get in. And there's, I think, a few other internship opportunities. Teresa, you might. Um, it's really great for, um, I think it's 18 to 30. And it's great for students who are going to just be starting college or getting into college. Um, and the SCA also has opportunities for high school students too, I believe. So if they wanted to take a look at it, it might be a good segue for them. Well, awesome. We wanna thank you guys so much for, we really appreciate your time and you've given us such great amount of information, but Teresa and, and Yolanta, thank you guys so much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for listening, <laughs> sharing our story. <laughs> And then for uh, all our viewers at home, thank you for tuning in. And we hope you get the chance to check out the site in real life sometime <laughs> outside of Zoom and uh, continue to join us at the National History Academy as we continue to explore America's great historic landscapes and uh, say, see you same time next week. Thanks.